make sure you shine a light on how things are going in different groups because scrutiny increases the social pressure people feel to make different kinds of hiring and promotion decisions and attend to a lack of diversity. So scrutiny matters, highlighting social norms when they're positive social norms, meaning, hey, you're the only group in the company that hasn't yet promoted a woman to this a senior ranks. That kind of scrutiny and those kinds of social norms matter. Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of work and faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. We'll be covering a diverse range of topics, bringing you the latest insights and knowledge that you can apply to your life and to work. So get ready to dive into new ideas with The Ripple Effect. So you have done a lot of research around gender in the workplace, and, and that's obviously a very important topic these days. A lot of questions have been answered. There are still a lot of unanswered questions out there. What are some of those that have kind of inspired your research in this area? Yeah, I think some of the important, the most important questions are frankly, how do we solve it? How do we solve the issue that women are still underrepresented at the top of organizations? And uh, we are trying so many things. Is it that we need to eliminate bias and change the individuals in the organizations to be more open-minded about uh, working with women? And that's one possibility. Is it that we need to change the structure of organizations so we can make them more accommodating to the different needs and preferences and strengths and challenges that women face? Is it uh, that we need to eliminate the biases that women face, not by changing the shape of the organization, but the way decisions are made inside the organization. So there's all these different possibilities in terms of what can fix what I think most people at this point agree is a real problem because enormous amount of talent is not being tapped to generate the best outcomes for organizations. And we, the truth is we still don't know. We don't know the right combination of solutions, but my research and the research of many who I collaborate with is trying to pick away at some of the um, big questions there and, and get some answers. So going back a few years, you had done a study on the effectiveness of diversity training. If you can go back and take us through that study, what were you setting out to do? What did you learn? And, and really particularly about how these programs affect women. Thank you for that question. This is a really exciting project that I got to work on with a massive team uh, at Wharton several years ago. And it came about because at the time I was co-directing the Wharton People Analytics Initiative, along with Adam Grant and Angela Duckworth and Cade Massey and others, and the four of us in particular felt that one of the most pressing questions in people analytics that needed to be answered was whether or not these diversity trainings that so many organizations were pouring money into were adding value. And also, you know, could we build one that was really effective? That was our real goal as well. Let's let's prove whether or not this works and let's build the best version of a diversity training we can, given what we know about the science of discrimination and bias in organizations. So um, we found First of all, an incredibly brave organizational partner. It was a, a Fortune 500 company that was ready to team up with us and do this project. And the reason I call them brave is because it's a really challenging thing to do as an organization to open yourself up to testing uh, to see whether or not there's potential gender bias and if you can combat it in your organization. It opens you up to lawsuits. And a lot of organizations are not brave enough to team up with academics and do that kind of science. So we found an amazing partner. Uh, we had a, at the time, first year PhD student passionate about this topic, Edward Chang at the Warren School. Now he's a professor at Harvard Business School. We're very proud of having mentored him and the amazing work he did leading this. And we built a roughly one hour online diversity training program. It was primarily focused on introducing people to the idea of gender bias, teaching them about the science showing that women are uh, often facing backlash when they do things like negotiate for higher salaries, that uh, there are implicit biases that influence the way we judge other people, even if we don't explicitly intend to discriminate, that we have different associations with women. We expect them to spend time in the home, uh, and it's easier for us to sort 
words that we associate with women, with words we associate associate with doing work in the home, um, than it is for us to sort those words with with men. It's easier for us to sort words related to career with um, men than it is for us to sort those words with women. And there's speed tests called implicit association tests that you can take that show you that even when you'd say, I 100% support women at work, I do not hold any belief that women need to be at home as opposed to in the office. Uh, in spite of that, you'll still show these implicit associations because it's like smog. It's been around you your whole life and you absorb these stereotypes that are in the world. So we had participants take one of these tests and then we armed them with tools that they could use to actually try to combat bias at work. We uh, pointed out to them, for instance, that one strategy that's been proven effective for reducing gender bias is say you're evaluating CVs and you're worried you might be giving priority to men rather than women who are otherwise equally qualified for a job just because of your implicit biases. Well, one thing you can do is you can evaluate CVs without names associated with them. It's called blinding. That's a way that you can eliminate bias from that process. So we gave them a series of tools of that sort and walked them through some scenarios so they could think about how to use them. We're really proud of what we built. So let me go back for a second because the company that you worked with, Fortune 500 company, and you call them brave, uh, how did you convince them in the first place to do this study? Because this could be, as you said, uh, some fairly uh, sensitive areas that they would be going into. Yeah, it's a really great question. It was honestly a company that uh, was really intrinsically motivated. They cared deeply about being a thought leader in this space. And they were hopeful that if we could build something together, and I should say they contributed a lot of insights because um, ideally, in my from my perspective, and I know from my collaborators' perspectives as well, when we're trying to build something that can go in and, and improve organizations, it's really helpful to have people inside those organizations thinking through these issues with you, not just scientists who sit all day and read academic papers and teach, but people who are on the front lines. So they, they wanted to contribute to building the best possible training that could exist and then proving out, you know, whether it added value and if it did, they would they would be a thought leader in, in being able to share um, those insights with the world and say that that they were on the the cutting edge. So that was the motivation with the recognition that there was a big risk if things didn't work or if things looked bad in the organization of of some kind of lawsuit ensuing. So it was a it's a tricky balance to walk. And I will say in the end, I'm not allowed to say the name of the organization that we partnered with. And that was one of the stipulations that we all agreed to to protect them when we started right. the project. So when you're talking about diversity training programs, are there downsides that 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 you see to that uh, type of uh, concept? And are there limitations as well? Yeah, well, it's a fantastic question whether or not there may be some downsides to diversity training programs. And that's really what we set out to test by developing this partnership with a Fortune 500 company, doing a randomized controlled trial to evaluate whether or not randomly assigning some people to complete a diversity training program and others to complete an unrelated program for an hour would produce benefits or not for women at the organization. We did this with thousands of employees and we measured a number of different outcomes. We looked first at attitudes. At the end of both programs, both the diversity training and a, I'll call it a placebo training program that focused on entirely unrelated material, we asked people questions about their attitudes towards women in the organization and in general and, and you know ways of supporting them. We had some little scenario questions where we asked in the scenario, you know, how might you try to problem solve in the scenarios related to supporting women? Um, so those that's a simple sort of attitudinal or scenario based way of evaluating whether the training had an impact. But we also really cared about downstream consequences. Would women be treated differently in the organization? Would people uh, make more of an effort, for instance, when they had an opportunity to nominate women for awards? Would they be more willing to mentor women when mentoring opportunities came up? And so we had a number of different measures where we looked at exactly those kinds of outcomes, mentoring signups, um, award nominations, and even what we call an, a, a little audit experiment where people an email went out and invited people to uh, offer support and information to a new female employee at the company or male employee. And we looked at, was there a difference in the willingness to support new female versus male employees as a function of whether you'd been through the training or not? Okay. So these are all 
different measures. And the question is, what did we find? Does it backfire? Does it work? Does the diversity training produce the outcomes we had hoped for? All right. I wish I had a really simple answer for you. If I had to boil it down to one thing, I would say diversity training wildly underperforms expectations, but it's subtler than that. So um, on average, we see that it has bigger effects on attitudes than on actions. Very little evidence of movement in terms of behavior. In terms of um, the attitudinal lift, though, uh, we do see that it's having an impact particularly on those who uh, the subpopulation they belong to suggests they had more room for growth because the average attitudes in that subpopulation started out lower at baseline. Um, this means it's helping maybe change the attitudes a bit more for uh, men in international settings uh, in particular. How about behavior change? What I think is really interesting about the behavior changes was actually the opposite. So the people who whose behavior was shifted most tended to be the people whose attitudes were most aligned to begin with with the training. Um, in fact, women in my women are the, the group that ended up changing their behaviors the most. But one of the interesting things is that some of the behavior change we saw was not the kind we were expecting. So we were expecting to lead more people to sign up to mentor women if they'd gone through the training, for instance. And we do see that, but we actually also saw women looking for mentorship themselves at a higher rate when they'd gone through the training, which was really interesting. So one of the key results, and P.S., this also happens with minorities who go through the training, is that we may, through the training, have made it more salient to women and minorities that they needed sponsorship, that there were threats to their success in the organization, and they needed to look out for themselves and find other women and minorities to support them. That's not normally what we think of as the goal of a diversity training, right? The goal of a diversity training is how do we ensure that our workforce, um, particularly those in positions of power, are providing more support to women and minorities. Instead, what we're doing is alerting women and minorities to look out for themselves. So it's not necessarily a, a bad result. That may be beneficial, but it's not the intention of the program. It's, it's not the reason that billions of dollars are being poured into these kinds of uh, programs at, at companies around the world. So I guess there is part of this that a lot of people will think about the quote unquote fixing the people, but I would think there's also have to be a focus to a degree on fixing the system as well, correct? Yeah. I think that's one of the most important takeaways from all the work that I have done and all of the work I have read in the last several decades of a blossoming amount of research in this area of how do we increase diversity in organizations, that when we try to fix people and say, you know, we're just going to make the managers better at treating women and minorities with respect, or we're going to make the organization friendlier um, by, by changing um, the way that we talk about diversity. These solutions... I'll put, I should put solutions in air quotes there. These solutions generally have not lived up to expectations. For instance, our diversity training. Well, I should say a, a key limitation of the research we did is that we're looking at a one hour online training. You might see something really different if you did a week of training with a trained facilitator and, and you know, really hammered these points differently. So that's a limitation of the work, but still every study I have seen points in the same direction of if we just try to, you know, fix attitudes, change beliefs, um, try to change people, the result, it's, it's just much harder to do that. And this is true not only when it comes to gender diversity issues in organizations, which is what we're talking about now, but any kind of human biases. And I tend to study decision making more broadly. I look at gender diversity, but I also look at other biases and judgment besides biases against certain groups of people that can lead us to make mistakes, they're incredibly hard to train away. What we find in both situations is that works. what works much better than training is changing systems. So systems support better decisions. And, and that's really what we're finding time and again, don't fix the person, fix the system they're embedded in. So the system is more, is better structured to support the outcomes we want to see. And I can talk more about what that means exactly, if you'd like. Well, and, and can you also uh, talk about this concept of isolated choice effect and, and how that does work as well? 
Yes. Yeah, so this is an example of changing systems as opposed to changing people. And it's a project that actually I just want to highlight. Uh, we just talked about this wonderful doctoral student from Wharton who came in as a first year, led this amazing team um, in, in testing the value of diversity training. His name is Edward Chang. And Edward also uh, is one of the co-lead authors on um, this work on the isolated choice effect, along with another Fortin, former Wharton PhD student, Erica Kyrgios, um, who's now a professor at Chicago Booth. So the folks who were training and doing this work are now thought leaders at all of our peer institutions, which just makes us incredibly proud. So um, Edward and Erica led this project along with Anish Rai and myself, where what we were trying to do is figure out whether or not we could restructure the way that selection decisions are made to improve outcomes for women. What do I mean by selection decision? So you can think of a selection decision as who am I going to hire for this job or who am I going to put on this prestigious uh, committee or panel or, you know, put up in front of my organization and highlight as a as a star. So who is going to get selected for opportunities that are important? And, and one way we could make those kinds of selections is um, normally when we think about promotions, hires, we can make those decisions one at a time, right? We have at the Wharton School, we hire a bunch of new faculty every year, and you know we often will have a separate search for each and every faculty hire. You know, now we're looking for someone in marketing. Now we're looking for somebody in operations, and we're going to look for one person this spring in operations, another person in the fall. So we isolate those choices one hire at a time. But another way you can make choices and hiring decisions is actually in sets. You can say we're going to have a cluster hire. We're going to hire five new faculty in this department right in the spring. We're going to hire, um, or we're going to put five people in, in this award category as opposed to one at a time. So we have options because any organization that is growing is, you know, it has opportunities and they can be clustered or not. And what we hypothesized is that when people hire or promote or select people for opportunities one at a time, they focus on just the attributes of the person in front of them and don't think globally about how that person is contributing to the diversity of the organization. They're just looking at the one person um, that's their focus. When they hire in sets, our hypothesis was, they're going to, because of the nature of the set, attend to what the group looks like, right? So if I hire five people in a row at the Wharton School one at a time, I probably don't even notice how those five people look at it as a group because I'm zoomed in looking at the candidate set and choosing, oh, this is the person I think is best for this role, this role, and so on. But if I hire five at a time, instead I'm thinking, wow, oh gosh, how did I end up hiring five people who are all from the exact same university and the exact same, have the exact same you know, dissertation advisor? Uh, they all look the same. You know, they all walk the same and talk the same. I might notice if there's a lack of diversity because Hiring in a set forces me to attend to that. And that is what we found in study after study, actually, when we randomly assign people to make selection decisions one at a time versus mm -hmm. in sets, people so select more diverse pools of candidates. When they're choosing from exactly the same applicant pool for each hire, they make more diverse selections in sets than in singletons. The set forces a focus on the aggregate on whether you're creating a pool that has diversity, that, that supports your values, that, um, that reflects the diversity you want to have in uh, an effective organization. But when you hire in isolation, you don't have that. So that's a structural change. It's not, I'm not changing the people who are making higher decisions, hiring decisions. I'm not training them. I'm not suggesting to them to focus on diversity. But what naturally happens when we look at sets is we think about diversity. And when we look at singletons, we don't. And PS, this is something that's been known for a while when people make product choices, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're ordering snack, you know, you get to order five days of lunch for the week ahead all at once, or you order it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. People order more diverse menu sets if they're choosing all at once because they're like, oh, I don't have salmon every day. But if they're <laughs> if they're ordering every day, they pick the same dish every day in and day out because they're they're focusing just on that one choice. So it's interesting that the same phenomenon that would lead to different behaviors when we're thinking about products also leads to these different patterns of hiring behavior that can be so important if you want to create a diverse organization. You've also looked at how social norms uh, affect a group composition and tend to contribute to underrepresentation of women. What did you find happening there? 
Yeah. So you will laugh because yet again, guess who was leading this work? My amazing former student, Edward Chang, who's now a professor at the Harvard <laughs> Business School. So I, I do a lot of work with doctoral students on this topic. And Edward was an incredibly productive um, student who really is passionate about understanding gender diversity in organizations. And we had a, a great series of collaborations. Um, this is actually, though, I have to say, this is a project. The idea came from my husband. So I just have to give him a shout out. He's a physics professor here at Penn. And he said to me, Katie, I have noticed that it seems like when a physics department decides they lack gender diversity, they panic. They put a whole lot of effort into a hire finding, stealing a woman from another top institution. They get one and then they breathe a sigh of relief, say our problem is solved and they never think about it or talk about it again. And he said, does that happen? Is it just like, are people just trying to grab tokens and then they, they put a checkbox and they quit? And I said, you know, that's a really interesting question. I have this amazing new doctoral student. His name is Edward Chang. Let me see if we can come up with a way to test your hypothesis. But in a, a setting that we think might be more consequential even than academic physics departments, um, we decided to take it to the boardroom. Mm -hmm. And what we wanted to do, and this is joint work, I should say, with um, Mirupe Akinola of Columbia and Dolly Chug of uh, NYU, is we grabbed the universe of data on who sits on corporate boards at Fortune 500 companies. We actually also looked at for the Fortune 1500 in the study, but we zoomed in particularly on the Fortune 500 and some of the analyses. And um, we looked for f at the distribution of the number of women on boards. And we realized that if there were cliffs in that distribution, meaning if there was a point at which you could clearly see a giant discontinuity in the representation of women, that might suggest something about organizations satisficing, trying to sort of reach a specific point and then quitting on their efforts to achieve diversity in the boardroom along the lines of my husband's hypothesis uh, in physics departments. So um, we actually did something that I, I'm very proud of. We, we created this little simulation. It's like taking all the board directors and, and all the Fortune 1500 companies and playing musical chairs with them. And we'll say, you know, imagine there's no, these are the people who are on boards and we'll even, you know, if people are on multiple boards, we'll keep them on multiple boards, but we're going to resort them and reshuffle and we'll do it a thousand times and we'll figure out what would the distribution of women look like if this is how boards were created with no attention to the uh, diversity, just taking the people who are available and, and shuffling them randomly. And then we're going to compare that random shuffle to what we actually see and see if it looks like there's any contortions, any cliffs suggesting a magic number above which boards stop making an effort to achieve women. And when we compare the two distributions, the, the musical chairs that's gender neutral and the reality, we see a huge gap. The huge gap is actually not at the magic number one, it's at the magic number two. So mm -hmm. boards, you can see this giant discontinuity, boards are racing to get exactly two women and then they stop trying there's a, a giant drop off relative to what you'd expect if they were just, you know, seating women uh, at the same rate as, as any other member of the population that's out there and available for board seats. Um, and interestingly, when we do a historical analysis, we can go back in time with our time machine because boards, the seat, who's seated on boards has been tracked for ages. We can actually see that there was a transition point from tokenism. It used to be that ones were the magic number when boards quit to tokenism um, about a little over a decade ago. Uh, so um, what's going on, you might be asking. It turns out the social norm at this point is most boards have two women. That's the average number. And if you have less, uh, you are deviating from all the others and you might be called out in the media and uh, you might be, you know, la labeled the kind of company that's not supporting women and putting them on your boards. And so we actually see that um, companies that tend to be more scrutinized seem to show this cliff to a greater degree. Companies of the Fortune 500, which are particularly under the microscope more than the 1500, show a greater degree of this bias. And we ran little experiments where we showed... Um, when you're choosing who to add to a group outside of the boardroom, right? Just any sort of selection decision, social norm information is very salient and leads to these kinds of clustering effects. Nobody wants to be the outlier who has fewer women than usual because they worry that um, that will yield 
you know, negative repercussions. So I think this is another really interesting finding. And what's important about it to me is what it shows is the power of scrutiny. That one of the reasons that organizations, especially at the highest levels, are attending to diversity and, and, and making an effort is they don't want to be called out. And that gives us power. Because if we, as a, as a community, we as a society, um, want to see greater diversity, then we need to continue to um, point out when organizations aren't achieving it. And that is highly motivating and leads them to better behavior. Now, does that mean that we're going to see some bizarre actions as a result, like clustering and sort of everybody else has two, so we're okay if we have two. Yeah, it does. Um, but net net, it means that the pressure and the scrutiny are working and we're seeing this upward pressure continue and the number of women on boards, the average keeps creeping up. And just as we saw a tipping point where eventually um, tokenism gave way to tokenism, hopefully we'll get to the point where it's humiliating to have a board with uh, less than three women. And we need to put the same pressure, I should say, in terms of board diversity, in my opinion, on um, on it on minority representation. Uh, so I think we're doing better with gender representation and creating that scrutiny right now than, than we have with um, creating scrutiny around minority representation. So what then should organizations do uh, in, in terms of confronting gender bias? What are the recommendations that you believe they should consider? Okay, I have a few recommendations. So one thing I wanna start with is I don't think you should use diversity training as your solution. That is not going to fix your problem. Um, two, a thing that you can do is make sure you shine a light on how things are going in different groups because scrutiny increases the social pressure people feel to make different kinds of hiring and promotion decisions and attend to a lack of diversity. So scrutiny matters. Highlighting social norms when they're positive social norms, meaning, hey, you're the only group in the company that hasn't yet promoted a woman to this a senior ranks. That kind of scrutiny and those kinds of social norms matter. Um, third, when you can hire in sets rather than in singletons, that is going to lead to greater diversity in your hiring pool because only when we hire in sets do we seem to really attend to um, these issues of diversity. And then a final point that's unrelated to my research, but I think an incredibly important finding that should be used more here is that um, there's been some really wonderful research done led by... Um, Joyce He of UCLA and Sonia Kang of the University of Toronto showing that uh, women, because of probably stereotypes and the backlash they sometimes face when they um, self-nominate for things like promotions, are very much less likely to put their hand up when it's time to be um, promoted, even when they've performed at the same level as others. And this this is research also by Muriel Niederly of Stanford showing women undercompete relative to men when they have the same credentials. So what Sonia and Joyce did is they they experimented with changing organizational defaults, meaning in most organizations, if you want a promotion, you have to say, I would like to apply for this promotion. But what if you flipped the structure and you said everyone who has met a certain qualification threshold is going to be considered for a promotion. You, you're welcome to opt out if you really don't want to be leveled up in this organization. There may be personal reasons you really don't, but, but you will be considered unless you request that you not be considered. And guess what? Women ended up being in the consideration set and therefore promoted dramatically more in the second system where the default, the the situation is that you'll be considered whether you volunteer or not. So thinking about the fact that women may be more hesitant to put their name forward, they may be less willing to compete and creating structures where it's easier because the friction is in the other direction where you're, everyone's going to compete and you have to actually exert some energy to avoid it. That can create a more level playing field. As for women in the workplace, what do you think they can do to try and level that playing field? Well, one thing that I think is really important is having a strong group of mentors. We know that's important and that women tend to have weaker networks than men um, because, uh, frankly, we, we, uh, we know about homophily, which is a tendency to affiliate with others who are like ourselves. And if you're at the top of an organization and you're a woman, you're going to find fewer people who are like you, you can affiliate with and chat with at the water cooler. So that's a challenge. Um, and, and recognizing that and actually making extra efforts to, to look out for opportunities to connect with others, to make sure you have strong networks 
um, and strong bonds. And that's really important. Um, I actually have a group in my own life that is a no club. And this is based on research that was done by Linda Babcock at Carnegie Mellon University and collaborators showing that women are too willing to say yes to non-promotable tasks at work. We're too quick to do sort of the office housework, taking notes in a meeting, organizing the holiday party, the, the kinds of things that aren't ultimately rewarded, but can be very time consuming. And um, Linda and her collaborators, their solution to this, and they've written a wonderful book, by the way, called The No Club, was to create a group of women who were at a similar career stage who helped support each other in saying no when it was necessary. Because interestingly, even though we're bad at saying no for ourselves, women are, are just as good at, at men as saying no for others, recognizing when others should make a certain decision. Um, we're very good at, at arguing for other people. So, uh, and we're, we're good at arguing for ourselves too when we're comfortable doing it. It's just, there's a lot of pressure against it. And often we conform or, or fold in the face of that pressure. So I actually have a no club in my life. It includes a couple of other female academics at a similar career phase. And when we face challenges about things that we're not sure, is this a yes or is it a no? And frankly, advice in general, we reach out to each other. And it has been the most amazing resource for a few reasons. Um, one is the expected. I expected it would be a great resource because they'd give me wisdom and sort of consulting from brilliant people. It also creates social connection and makes me enjoy my work more to have these awesome supporters in, in my camp and to be supporting these other terrific women. Um, but the third reason, which I didn't anticipate, but has really been there too, is that every time they ask me for advice, I'm learning. So they will face a challenge. They will need to figure out, you know, should I do this or not? And from an arm's length view, and when it's not me, I can see clearly what the answer is. And then once I've said, oh, no, you should definitely say no to that opportunity. I am confident this is the wrong thing for you. When I face a similar challenge, it's built my confidence and competence to respond and handle that situation myself. And what's really interesting, actually, is uh, I've gotten to be involved in some research led by um, Lauren Eskris Winkler, now at Kellogg, former Wharton postdoc, showing that when we give advice to others, it actually improves our own outcomes, not just in the domain of, you know, this no club that I'm describing where a lot of the decisions have to do with gender and work, but you know, high school students who we randomly assign to give advice to their younger peers get better grades because they just coach someone else on how to get good grades. And when you coach, you learn. So yeah. I think a really interesting thing that women can do is actually build these kinds of advice clubs uh, so that they have stronger networks, stronger social connections. They're benefiting from others who can see clearly in places where they can't how to not conform to stereotypes, but make those decisions that are better for their career. And in advising others, they're going to gain benefits to competence, confidence, um, and social support. So I would advise all women to have advice clubs. And P.S., men should have them as well. But this may be a particularly useful tool for women who can't say no. Where do you think the, the gender equality question ends up taking us, let's say, a decade from now? Honestly, I'm such an optimist, especially after doing, for instance, the work we discussed on tokenism and corporate boards and seeing how things have evolved. Now they've evolved slowly. I wish they'd evolved a lot faster, but we're seeing progress in the right direction. And I think the pressure and scrutiny have accelerated. Um, so I'm hopeful. I'm feeling very hopeful that things are going to continue to get better. And there's certainly a lot of scientific attention on this question. When I was a graduate student first starting to do some research related to race and gender bias and, and how could we solve it. It was not a very popular area. And I think as um, it's become easier and easier to collect massive data sets, as A-B testing has become more straightforward to do in organizations and more accepted, maybe in part because of the, you know, tech being such a, a big part of um, the corporate world and, and so much A-B testing there, it's becoming more part of the culture. We're, we're accelerating insights about what works. And as those insights become more widely adopted, I think, along with the increased attention to these issues and desire for equality, I'm optimistic that um, we can use science to get where we want to be. Katie, thanks very much for your time today. All the best. Thank you so much for the great questions and for having me on the show. Thank you. Katie Milkman, who's a professor of operations, information and decisions here at the Wharton School. 
Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.